So the doctrinal legacy reveals a four decisions which come out against the interests of diversity. We might set aside the uh, Austin case involving the utility district because it simply involved the decision to create a bailout procedure. But if you look at the availability of bailout as a possible precedent for the exemption of many other districts from the requirements of preclearance, perhaps we can argue that Austin is the first step in dismantling Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. In all the other instances, however, in the case of Bartlett, in the case of Parents, and also in the case of Riki, the decisions are made against the interests of minorities and in opposition to the interests of expanding diversity in several contexts. So in addition to this doctrinal legacy, the early decisions also reveal a court whose racial decisions are characterized by ambivalence, by activism, and antagonism. There is ambivalence as to the continued relevance of law in the maintenance and elimination of racial segregation and disadvantage. In the parents' case involving school segregation, the court concludes that racial diversity in primary and secondary education is not a compelling interest. The court concludes that the Constitution is not violated by the mere existence of a racial imbalance in K through 12 schools, even in an instance when some of that racial imbalance is traceable to the existence of a dual school district in the Kentucky case. In the parents' case, the court made a departure from its decision in Grutter in which it recognized diversity as a compelling interest in the context of higher education and declined to recognize that interest in the context of K-12 through education. Also, ambivalence towards mitigating racial voting disparities. Again, the Bartlett, uh, the Bartlett case discards the necessity and capacity of courts to determine whether minority voters' ability to elect their own representatives is inferior to those of white voters. There was much evidence presented in this case to show that blacks did not have the same opportunity to elect their representatives. The court declines to expand Section 2, saying that it won't use the force of the Voting Rights Act to secure, the, to require increased cooperation um, in uh, selecting representatives. It also disregards the merits for applying Section 2 to a situation where there's undisputed white racial block voting, saying that political science data and race-based assumptions were too speculative, and thought that why not have a 50% threshold in order to adopt a simple standard. The gist then of Bartlett is that the court is willing to leave in place, despite the Voting Rights Act, acknowledge racial block voting uh, uh, with the rationale that it will be simpler to use 50% as a test. Also ambivalence towards a diverse workforce. The majority's decision to require a strong basis in evidence standard dismisses the history of employment inequality and also dismisses the great knowledge about testing methods as a ways of perpetuating disparate impact on minorities. And so that ambivalence towards a diverse workforce is also exists. Uh, Riki also is ambivalence towards a past history of inequality. Firefighting is a profession in which the legacy of racial discrimination casts an exceptionally long shadow. Uh, in the early 70s, African Americans were 30% of New Haven's population, but only 3.6% of the city's firefighters. And if we are to walk around the country and examine the history, including the history in Chicago, we would see very similar uh, histories and legacies of discrimination uh, against which uh, black firefighters fought valiantly. They not only fought the fires, but also fought the fires of discrimination in order to achieve a place in a revered profession. 
also ambivalence towards the most effective methods for evaluating employee qualifications. A firefighter's job is very complex. It involves interpersonal skills, complex decisions, the ability to make decisions under pressure. Um, there's an argument that relying solely on a test in order to measure these qualifications is extremely short-sighted. As to activism, the court has exhibited a rejection of deference and respect in areas of law that have been considered primary areas of state and federal authority. And it's been started to imply and signal that it may make unfavorable future decisions when those issues come before the court. So even though the court is deciding a specific issue, this Roberts Court continues to signal that when an appropriate case comes before it, it will perhaps decide whether to overturn prior decisions. So the rejection of deference shows up in both parents and in Bartlett where the courts seem to be using principles to strip the states of their ability to increase racial diversity. The court is adopting a color blindness. In the case of Bartlett, decides not to see the racial disparities in voting. Uh, in the case of parents, to disregard the fact that the schools in both states are segregated and that the biggest factor it seemed to be in that segregation um, was the race of the children involved. So headed to a colorblind society, which does represent perhaps a trend, but the Roberts Court wants to uh, enliven that trend. Also signaling the future decisions. So in the employment context, uh, Riki, Justice Scalia alludes to the court's reevaluation of Title VII. He says that the dispute merely postpones the evil day on which the court <coughs> will have to confront the question whether or to what extent the disparate impact provisions of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act are constitutional. Uh, that's a longer conversation about that constitutionality, but the gist of it is that under the Constitution, without legislation, only intentional discrimination is a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. On the other hand, Congress has decided that in order to provide a level playing field in, in public employ, employment, that it will afford employees a, dispar a disproportionate impact theory of discrimination so that those non-provable instances of intentional discrimination may nonetheless be prohibited under Title VII. And so Justice Scalia is suggesting that if Congress has enacted a standard that brings more discrimination into the courts than the Title VII, than the Constitution would bring into the courts, that that standard might be beyond Congress's ability to impose. And so uh, Justice Scalia signaling that at some point he might urge the court to strike down the disparate impact wing of Title VII. In the Northwest Austin case as well, the court implied that the exceptional conditions that justified the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act may no, no longer exist. So again, here's a case involving the Voting Rights Act. The court was asked whether it wanted to strike down the preclearance provisions of the Voting Rights Act as unconstitutional. The court declined to do so by creating the possibility for exceptions and bailout. That said, the court goes on to say that the exceptional conditions that justified the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act may longer exist, laying the foundation then for another case in which it can address the question it avoided in Northwest Austin, whether the court should declare the Voting Rights Act unconstitutional. 
The court says that the country is a very different place than it was when the Voting Rights Act was required. And much of this discussion is on the heels of the argument that we are a colorblind society as a result of the election of President Obama. Antagonism, an exceptional amount of division and factionalism and verbal sparring in the decisions under the Roberts Court. Now, to be fair, they sometimes fight a lot before, they fought a lot before Roberts was on the court. But it is certainly going on under his watch. First of all, uh, the case is split 5-4. We have the uh, one case that's 8-1, but the case is split 5-4, a lot of division. Um, the justices, um, who have applied reasoning that narrows or potentially narrows the scope of laws that are designed to preserve racial equality are here before you. On the other hand, the other group of justices are committed to the enhancement of laws that establish and expand racial equality and more permissive interpretations of the Constitution where those interpretations would promote diversity and opportunity. And I've already said that of the five justices, although Justice Kennedy um, signals that under some circumstances he might be willing to be persuaded that uh, concerns about diversity uh, might um, lead him to approve certain programs. Um, he is often voting with this majority, but leaving over the, open the possibility that he might be persuaded um, otherwise in future cases. So four justices, Justice Kennedy then as a swing justice, and four justices on the other side strongly committed. Uh, the language of Justice Ginsburg in many opinions uh, sounds very reminiscent of the language of Justice Marshall. She is one of the most powerful voices reminding the country that we have a 350 year legacy of racial discrimination and inequality, and it is unlikely that we will make substantial progress in eliminating that legacy for some time to come. She's made that point several times along with her, her colleagues. And then we have the question with Kennedy. They also verbally spar a lot and make lots of condescending arguments and caricature their opposing arguments. In parents, a lot of sparring. Justice Thomas equated the school board's desire to create diversity in their classrooms to the segregationist desire to uh, to keep the races segregated in brown. So he equated the school board's desiring racial diversity in the classroom to the segregationists in brown who wanted to keep those children apart. In parents, Justice Breyer, Justice Breyer took the unusual step of delivering his dissent from the bench. Uh, he said the majority has forgotten the lesson of history, abandoned the hope and promise of Brown. And Justice Ginsburg points out that his dissent signals, the fact that he took the time to announce his dissent from the bench signaled not only that the court opinion in parents was wrong, but that it was grievously, grievously misguided. Um, other cases not involving race are examples of this verbal sparring for which this Roberts Court may be remembered. The court uh, just a few days ago decided a case involving the Confrontation Clause. The question presented there was whether the uh, a statement made by a, a victim who had since died could be admitted despite the protection that the defendant has to confront witnesses. 6-2, the court concludes that the statement uh, may be admitted into court. Um, Justice Scalia goes farther than simply saying that Justice Sotomayor's decision is wrong. He says it's patently incorrect, a vain attempt to make the incredible plausible, a distortion of the confrontation clause, leaving the confrontation clause in stambles. And this is just only one example of that kind of rhetoric. Uh, 